Hello and welcome to the Runners World podcast with me, Rick Pearson. And me, Ben Hobson. Today we're speaking with elite marathon runner, Rose Harvey. Thanks very much for having me again. No, great. Uh, I think last time we talked to you, it was in March and you just run sub 230 in Seville. Yep. Decent bit of running. Yeah, 227. <laughs> back it up in London. Your first British female in London. That must have been an amazing day out. Yeah. Oh, it was incredible. And just somehow all the stars aligned. And it was, it was honestly, I mean, I don't think I had, it was one of those days that happened so infrequently in elite running, but just everything just fell together. And I had absolutely no expectations today. I think I had the least expectations for any race of my career so mm. far. But yeah, somehow I pulled it off and it was it was just the most amazing day. Yeah. Um you had been hit by a car a few days before the race. So when the stars align, that's probably not the stars <laughs> that you wanted to align for that race. <laughs> but so what happened there? What I mean, you went in banged up. Yeah, I went in pretty banged up and training had actually gone pretty well, but it had been it had been a really short build up. So I didn't I was confident, but I was thinking, you know, I haven't had the ideal prep. Uh, I was I competed at the World Championships in Oregon and got COVID. So I also had that that it took a little while to bounce back from that and actually get into training. So it was a really short build up, but it all gone really well. And then, yeah, 10 days before the race, I was just doing an easy run down to the common and a car pulled out their driveway and went straight into me. Or I went straight into the side of their bonnet. And my knee basically took the full brunt of it, tried to jog it off, got down, hobbled down to the bottom of the road and was like, mm, nah, this isn't happening. So I went back, several packs of peas on the knee and, yeah, woke up the next morning and basically couldn't move it. So... Wow. The next 10 days were a bit of a struggle and I remember I was in the Elite Hotel the day before and I ran, th I jogged three miles and I couldn't do any strides and I was like, how the hell am I going to get through a marathon? Yeah. But you know, you're there and no one knew about my knee either at the Elite Hotel. So you Hotel, kept a so. secret basically. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was basically in denial <laughs> 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 and yeah, good. thinking, right, if I don't think about it, maybe it won't be as bad. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, well either start or I don't start there's nothing else mm. I can do so I just yeah went in and thought we're gonna try and enjoy it so did the, the you say you had like no very limited expectation for the race was that because of the short build-up or the knee or just generally it wasn't part of your your plan for the year for that to be like such a big race no it was it was more the knee I think before that I actually I wasn't I didn't necessarily plan to do London originally but after Worlds and yeah having to DNF from that, I just, I needed a good race. Yeah. And I wanted to, I didn't want to finish the year on that note. So I was like, right, I'm going to, you know, Worlds was a, it was an incredible experience overall, but it was a disappointing race. Yeah. And London is the next best thing. You know, it's a, well, I mean, it was just the most amazing atmosphere on your home streets. And it was the one, you know, if I was going to do another race, I probably wouldn't have bothered with another marathon. But London being there, I was like, yeah. this is my opportunity mm. to redeem myself. And so, yeah, that that then became, I did actually have a lot of expectations for it before I got hit by a knee and hit by a car and kind of my knee put pay to everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, when something, when, when a day is going well, do you know early on, do you actually get a sense within like the first four or five miles, you're like, actually, I feel great and this is going to be a good race? Or is it, is it something that actually you have to wait until mile 20 to realise like, how it's going to go for you. I think with a marathon, you can never be that sure mm. until you get to the really mile, you know, the last 10K. I I do, I think especially this year, you know, I was going along knowing that, okay, I'm, I'm getting through it, but mm. it was literally take each mile at a time. And I was getting through it, but I was like, at any point, my knee could just give out. Yeah. And that could be it. And... Yeah, I think generally in a marathon, you know, you see so many people absolutely flying till mile 20 and then fall off a cliff. So mm. I, don't, I think, you know, in shorter races, maybe you can get an idea from the mm. get-go that you feel great. But I think marathon, you can never, don't, yeah, can never bank it. Yeah, for sure. Do you yeah. think that the, the potential of your knee just giving up, did that change your strategy from how you would have run the race anyway? Or were you just like, oh, I've got to go all in anyway? I think I just went all in. Yeah. Yeah, and tried not to think about it. Yeah, yeah. And just, yeah, I mean, the marathon's such a mental game. So actually a lot of my prep 
in that 10 days was, I mean, I couldn't actually do much running. So a lot of my <laughs> prayer was just like, right, how am I going to deal with my knee and, and the mental struggle of having an, an injury in the yeah, race? Yeah. And it was, yeah, a lot of, uh, I mean, I pulled on everything. And, you know, when it started, it wasn't, I was aware of it. It was sore throughout the race, but I was like, right, okay, if it doesn't get any worse, I can do it. And then I was thinking when it got sort of twinged a few times, I was like, right, okay, starting to hurt. But, you know, this is my coach, actually. I spoke to him just before the race. He didn't know about my knee, but he just happened to say the right thing. He was like, remember, when it starts hurting, that's when you show everyone how strong you are. And I just played that in my head and I applied it to my knee. I was like, right, it's hurting, but this is where I show everyone how strong I am. So it was really, you know, it just became a nice mental battle that I was was just determined to not let it stop me. Yeah, amazing. And you finished 10th overall, and I guess you would have finished ahead of lots of people who have been elite athletes their whole life. But your story is really incredible because that's that's actually not the trajectory that you've been on, is it? Yeah, not at all. I really, I started taking running seriously at the start of lockdown. And before that, I ran ran for Club and Chasers, my local club. But it was very much... A weekend hobby. Mm. Okay. And yeah. I'd, I've, I was working in corporate law, so yeah, it was a 100 mile an hour job, work yeah. late nights. The evening sessions were pretty much a write off most of the time. So I really did most of my running to and from work just to save getting on the tube <laughs> and yeah. a few sessions with the chasers. But, you know, it was very much amateur level. I think I was running kind of 35 miles a week. I normally, I actually trained for, I did the London Marathon twice before, but I remember I did. I got through it with basically doing three sessions a week and no other running. Okay, right, okay. <laughs> Apart yeah. from maybe like a run to and from work. Yeah. So, yeah, that was very much my approach. And then lockdown changed everything for me when I, I got made redundant and suddenly had three months garden leave right. and decided to just set myself a challenge and essentially train like a pro athlete for three months. Right. And I actually started training for triathlon originally, but... That then, like everything else in lockdown, got cancelled yeah. about three times. So that was where I kind of, yeah, really up my game and and started taking it more seriously. Got some help from a coach with my running, and it just snowballed, completely snowballed. And amazing, yeah. what a lockdown project! Yeah, I didn't do. That. I baked a bit of bread, I think. I didn't even do that. I did also <laughs> do that, but it was less successful than my running. Yeah, my, my baking of bread wasn't very good either. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think I had a few explosions of the starter <laughs> yeah. and gave up. <laughs> I mean. It's, it, because you you mentioned the previous marathons that you've done, you you're obviously a very talented runner. Like you had a natural ability there because you ran sub three for the first and then three oh four for the yeah. sub one. Yeah. So there's like that's already like as you say like amateur level. That's kind of top end. Yeah. So there was there wasn't it was not like me deciding to go. It's not like me trying to chase a pro <laughs> pro dream during not lockdown. Too, it's not too late. No, it's yeah. too late. So there was kind of like there was that. Did you have a a sense that you weren't getting enough from yourself or was it literally just like, I've got the time to try this? It was more, I've got the time to try it. I mean, mm. honestly, I didn't, you know, two, 255, 384 is, you're right, it's, I was sort of top, I'd say 10% of the women in my club, mm. but it's still such a big it's, it's, jump. It's not half that. an hour. Yeah, is, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I know that I knew that was that was where the pro level was at. And I was like, oh, well, I, you know, I, it didn't even come into my mm. imagination that I could get no, to that it's level. A huge, it's a huge leap in time. Yeah, like, I mean, you, exactly. You, you, it's tricky when you talk about time because it's all relative to everyone else's mm. performance. But yeah. the difference between an amateur running three hours and the pros running two and a half, that time like, the, at the sharp end, yeah. Making up those differences the is The minutes huge. become yeah. really yeah, yeah, hard yeah, yeah, at yeah. the end. Yeah. But I actually, when I, when I, after I was training for triathlon, and then that got cancelled, and then my kind of secondary goal was actually to go for a Surrey vest. So that was sort of the level that I thought I could top yeah. out at. And yeah. I was like, right, if I work really hard, I can probably run for my county. And that was very much the goal. And then, yeah, yeah my coach was like, no, you're going for an England vest. <laughs> Amazing. Did, did you have like a breakthrough performance and were you a bit like actually I have underestimated like the ceiling for me I think the first marathon I did after I mean it I didn't really have much opportunity to race anything yeah, before right. that yeah. date really because of lockdown and it was still we were still in lockdown but we found a marathon that kind of just you know those ones that like just complied with the rules yeah, yeah. and it was this random one in Cheshire round just country roads it, i think it was nine laps and you went off in groups of i don't know 
10 or something. Right. Um, and it was classified as elite only, but it, it wasn't that elite. I think it was sub three-ish. And that was, I ran 2.30 and 58 there. Yeah, well, anyway, that like, was like a 25 minute chunk off my PB, mm. and that was really where I think, to be honest, before before that time, I hadn't had a benchmark and I hadn't been running with anyone or had any races. Yeah. So I'd just sort of seen my times gradually get better, but that was the date when mm. I was like, oh, I've actually. Hang on a sec. Yeah. Yeah, taken yeah. a big mm-hmm. leap here. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that race environment brings it out, right? Like, you, yeah. If you're training in lockdown and you're not with people and all that sort of stuff, and then you're turn the line suddenly and you've got an opportunity to go and follow yeah. the right follow the right person or just steam off on your own i don't know how the race went but you know it's kind of you suddenly have this moment where you're going to go oh this has worked yeah, yeah. and yeah. then i think when you see your time sort of up where up yeah. there with other actual professional marathon runners yeah. and elites you're like oh actually i'm i'm there i'm in that bracket <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah how do you do it though like what is it is it mainly a volume thing is it mainly a time and dedication thing or, or they're kind of breakthrough ways of training or certain sessions that you were like that's actually made that made a huge difference to my marathon running i think it's honestly just this is a really boring answer because i wish i could give a recipe of <laughs> this is what you yeah. can go and do go and do these three sessions and suddenly your life will change yeah but it's just honestly consistency and yeah. i mean i did i did probably well i basically tripled my training yeah and if you do that you get fit yeah <laughs> But yeah, it's you know it is it's harder, it's hard to do it. It's hard to I think in a way I've been lucky that I've been able to tolerate that huge increase yeah, right. in training because yeah. it is difficult to do. And you know I definitely haven't gone on skates. I've had a fair few injuries along the way yeah. that are, are kind of as a result of ramping it up massively. Mm. But yeah, I went from you know running thirty five miles a week to. Actually, the first marathon build I did sort of seventy five, but okay. still, that's yeah. that's double it's low, my mileage. It's a low end, isn't it, for, yeah. for a leap? But yeah, yeah. Mm. And then with cross training on top of that, so it was it was a huge increase in training, mm. and just the consistency. Because before, mainly because of work, you know, running was very much a hobby. I mean, I still kind of think it is my hobby, <laughs> but it was very much a hobby. And if I had a busy week at work, then I might not run at all. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you lose that consistency, and you you just that's I think where you. You just need to build week on week on week to yeah. really see the changes. Yeah. It's a good answer, isn't it? And it's probably the reason why a lot of people don't do it. So it's actually, it's difficult and you've got to do consistent. It's not particularly exciting, some of it. It's actually yeah. just consistently doing it again and again. Yeah. And I think it's the big kind of mental change is you can't, you can't just run when you're motivated to run. You just, you have to commit. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. whether or not you want to go out, you have to go out. And I think that was a change for me and getting a coach to kind of hold me accountable. And actually before, you know, I would just run if I wanted to run to work and not get the tube. Yeah. And if it was raining, then I might not run for a week. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I want to run for ages. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that was a big change. Right, like, okay. right, you just yeah. get out every day, whatever you're feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking before we started recording just about how this is a bit of an off-season. You've not been running a lot recently, a couple of injuries that you've been sorting out, but how the when you had a job and the sort of like the non-running bit of life and the balance between that and now this is your job mm. and the not running and how that you've quite conflicted and but you're also quite good at not running like we have we've interviewed pros who really find it hard to step, yeah step I've back. got people but, really keeping the reins on me right. I've, I've learned that I have no self-control with holding back and taking rest yeah. so I now have someone who makes me take rest. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but do you, is, it, is it when taking the time when it was a man, when it was a tussle between the working life and the and the running life and the sort of the two bits and pieces, having the downtime now as your job and actually being forced to sort of slow down? Do you think that the, the old career side of you has actually kind of like allowed you to be a bit more calm about it, or do you think now that it's all all job, all running job, that you're kind of like still stressing about it? Yeah, I think I'm more stressed about it, oh, okay. actually, because when I was working, I could go into the office and actually throw myself 100% into work, which is what I should have been doing because it was my job. <laughs> but <laughs> when, you know, I was, it was actually almost a bit of a relief to be like, right, okay, I can be 100% on work and not yeah. sitting there being like, oh, I need this conference call to end now because I need to leave for training. So I had that and I had that distraction. Mm. But now it's like, it's actually my... F- 
it's funny because it's actually my job to rest and recover as yeah. well, but that doesn't really doesn't come naturally. I think because running is now my job, I think mm. should you be, there's definitely the part of me that's like, I should always be running. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the Runner's World podcast. Do you have a, like a marathon session that is a great gauge for how fit you are? If you're like, I, if I nail that session, I know that I'm in like decent shape. Yeah, there are a few. I think I've done, there's a great session I've done a few times, which is three by 10K or three by six miles, depending on kind of yeah. how you spend it. And that one's, that's always been sort of the peak of my training block. Right. And the one that I'll do just, I normally do about four weeks out. I like marathon pace. Yes. Okay. Mar- well, right. start a bit slower than marathon pace, then marathon pace, then a bit quicker than marathon okay. pace. And that one, if you nail that one, there's kind of a big build up to it. And that's where I always, it's like a dress rehearsal as well. I'll okay. wear my race kit, kit yeah, yeah. and get all my drinks ready and do the, do the full thing. And that's, I think. Yeah, that's a really mm. good benchmark. But actually, this time I had a new session, which I loved. And it's it actually focused a lot on, like, the last 10K of the marathon. Okay. So it was just – actually, yeah, it was pretty much 3 by 10K, but you just don't stop. <laughs> so okay, it was right. just progressive. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, six, six, six miles. And getting quicker the whole time. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that – I came out of that session. I actually did it at altitude as well. And it was brilliant. It was the best session of my – whole block yeah it's like i'm ready oh, i know yeah. i can do that and i pulled yeah. on it in the last 10k i remember the last 10k i was like hang on this is the bit i've practiced yeah, 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 <laughs> i've yeah. got it so yeah i think if you can basically any session that prepares you for that last 10k yeah and hitting marathon pace on knackered legs that is a is great prep yeah a confidence booster yeah so unfortunately it's such a big session isn't it it's not one we could do at lunchtime i don't think no Mm, no, no, I think maybe you might. just the 10k. Maybe we want 10k. No, no. I don't but, think you'd do much work in the no, afternoon. No, no, no. <laughs> but I think it's that psychological bit of it. It's great to come out of those sorts of those sort of phys- when you physiologically you feel fine tuned and you're kind of all all good. Yeah. And you kind of, but when you can tap into that at the end of a race, knowing full well that you've pushed possibly harder. Yes. In that moment, that's when it's those sorts definitely. of sessions yeah, really definitely. like yeah help. Yeah, definitely. Just so you don't freak out when it starts yeah. to really hurt. Yeah, yeah, which it will. Yeah. 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 In a, in a, <laughs> that is the marathon. <laughs> yeah. um, if we spin back to when we last spoke in March, at the end of the podcast, we kind of asked you about the change in career and sponsorship. Mm. You very ma- you managed the, uh, your response quite nicely and sort of said that there may be things coming. And, <laughs> sort of, and about a week later, you signed for Puma. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how did that come about and how's it, been, how's it been signing, you know, like a proper pro deal? Yeah, it's been amazing. It's actually quite funny how it came out. Like they they slipped into my DMs. Oh right, oh. <laughs> the modern way. Yeah, I got I got a message on Instagram from them, which I don't think is the normal way that people. Yeah, they're they're not like major corporations tend to approach <laughs> yeah. athletes for sure. But it works. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been brilliant. They're just they're honestly a great brand to work with, mm. and they've just got a lot of they've got a lot of momentum, mm. and you know they've been they're quite new to the the road running mm. scene really they've done a lot in track for a long time but the road running scene they've really they're really quite new to it and have put so much into it and so much into the shoes and honestly the team are just so passionate about it yeah mm. it's a really fun brand to work with and it's yeah just been in, involved with a lot of cool events with them and it is it's a lot more than just running in the kit okay which yeah. which has been amazing and I think at the time I was actually speaking with Nike as well and I got a very different picture from Nike as to kind of how the relationship was work would work right. and it was much more like you are the runner you run in the kit and we pay you to do that and that's yeah. it mm. but yeah Puma is much more of a, a kind of family and you're involved with the brand and yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a it's a full kind of it makes so much more of the career mm. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been brilliant. And they've got a super shoe, right? You presumably were wearing like a carbon plated shoe. In yeah, they've got they've got two. Well, they've actually they've mm. got two re- iterations of the first one now. And I actually ran in the second one, so I ran in the DVA Elite Two. Yeah. Which is not actually out yet. I have so many people be right. like, where can I buy it? <laughs> <Where can laughs> <get> <laughs> um, but it's not out yet. But it's the DVA Elite was their first. Okay, true. Right. So the second one is is the version two, and then they've got the fast R as well, which is um, oh, that's that pink and stack. orange one. 
Oh yeah, yeah, you've been running cool. it out, haven't you? Yeah, it yeah, looks yeah. very cool. It looks very kind of spacey, and yeah. you can see the carbon plate in it, so it's a very cool looking yeah. shoe. But yeah, it, I I actually run in both of them. Yeah, and they're great. Nice. I mean, it's it is interesting, like how the brand and the shoe is now so much part and parcel of like every like so new mm. york was at the weekend i don't know when this is going out but anyway new york happened recently and you know the winner was is an under armor athlete and she was wearing their new elite shoe mm. and the story is just like surprise winner in this shoe yeah. do you know what yeah. i'm talking about the shoe yeah, 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 yeah it becomes yeah. so much more of a thing when you were looking to have a sponsor and obviously Puma is slightly more, slightly newer to the game than Nike were, as you say, or whoever else you were talking to. Did that come into it? Were you kind of like going through their product list and being like, actually, I'm going to need something like that now? Or did it? was it sold? You know, you kind of knew that most brands are going to have something. No, it was, it was a really big factor for me. Mm. And I, to be honest, before I spoke to Puma, I hadn't run in any of their shoes. Yeah. So, and obviously for, I mean, for anyone, but particularly I think for Marathon, you know, you've got to, the shoes are so important. You've got to have something that really suits you to get yeah. through 26.2 yeah, yeah. without any discomfort because you do not want any shoe issues. And I'd, I'd run in I'd run in Nike and I'd run in Adidas and that's that's all I'd run in, basically. Yeah, yeah. So it was a really big consideration, but I I think I was, I was first of all convinced just because they taught me so much about how they made the shoe. You know, they'd spent, I think, three years making these shoes. Right. The innovation that went into them was insane. Mm. And they actually, they invited me out to Germany to go and see the, uh, basically where the magic happens, where they mm. make the shoes. And so I was kind of sold on, right, okay, they're, they're going to be good shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really then the question was just, do they fit and do they, are they comfy? Do they suit yeah, me? Yeah. Yeah. So I did have a, I had a good sort of two, three months of testing them. And I actually started speaking to them straight after Seville. So it was, I didn't, had a bit of time off then got into it so it was quite I had quite a long period of build up just testing the shoes yeah. and testing loads of different models and yeah checking that they worked for me so yeah it was a, it was a huge consideration yeah yeah definitely yeah I think like the difference that shoes can make yeah it's, it's never been more marked has it so you need to have something that can make I mean, you competitive you, I think, you know yeah. it's not it's really in the recent history of the sport that you've got people working rent, running in shoes out beyond outside their branded contract because yeah weren't gonna yeah, get the, to be they weren't gonna yeah. get the competitive benefits and yeah. from the sponsor so, you know it's it's a part and parcel of i guess like signing a, a deal these days is making sure that they deliver on that side yeah. of things yeah definitely yeah other than buying a lovely carbon plated shoe what advice would you have to anyone who might be starting their spring marathon training around now get any kind of training advice or just general running advice i think if starting a build up now just you know it's, it's a, that's a quite a long time to build up and actually I mean, it's, it's great to have that long so you don't rush it yeah but i think just take it slowly and maybe plan plan the whole block and i think the, the a classic mistake is you sign up for a marathon, get really excited and go absolutely hundred percent into yeah. the training week one because you're excited about the marathon. But you know, it's a long time and doing if you're if you know, if you're trying to kind of build up your volume, mm. just do it slowly. Just kind of plan how you're going to build up the miles each I think the the rule of thumb is sort of every third week increase your mileage a bit. Okay. Yeah. And that basically gives your body time to adapt to the new higher mileage. So just I think just careful planning yeah. and going at it with a nice you want, you want like the nice looking Strava curve of my <laughs> yeah rather than some sort <laughs> of like than, gigantic <laughs> ramp rather than like the Alps yeah, 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 yeah exactly <laughs> is there a part of your training that you've particularly focused on so say like now you're, you're we were talking you're still work you're sort of like in a base phase again. Mm. Is that like a period that you find we well, actually have got there's a podcast we did with Tom Craggs who's talking we're talking about base training and the sort of like position in the block and, and how important it is. Is there a phase for you that you always consider the, the the most important? Would you say it's the base level or do you find it's more the sort of like the, the more sharper end stuff later on? To be brutally honest, I think it's the first time I've actually ever done a base phase. There we go. <laughs> I've rolled from one marathon to the next right. and either been injured or just going full pelt at marathon training. Yeah. But having said that, I think I, I think the base phase is incredibly important, and I'm quite I'm, you know, it's, I'm of course itching to get back to running, but at the same time I'm enjoying just 
being able to take the time to build the foundations because mm. you, you've got to do that. And I'm getting in the gym a lot and working on all those things that you actually don't really do as much in my and training because you're knackered. Mm. And just, I think, building some strong foundations. You, you know, your body's got to carry you through 26 miles. So yeah. you've got to be strong and any weakness will come out in the marathon. So I think, yeah, it's so, like, base phase is so important and just kind of, like, niggle prevention and, and yeah. correcting all the tiny little issues that aren't really an issue but they could be if yeah. you don't nip yeah. them in the bud yeah looking forward what's the what's the ambition now you've done so well at london uh, for such an amazing kind of rise what are you what are you shooting for well paris 2024 is a big goal yeah so and it's, it's really not that long away so i think next year really is going to be the time when i've got to really get my time down mm. so what, what are we talking here like what sort of time would you have to run you think to get it is it 225 something like this or well the the qualifying time is 228 yeah well actually they haven't released the policy yet and i'm assuming it's 228 <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the world standard yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's i think realistically to be competitive it's going to have to be like 224 223 right okay. just because that's where the standard of yeah. women's running is at the moment yes yeah, yeah, yeah. it's amazing but it's it's tough yeah yeah when and is the First qualifying, oh, I don't know. So you? the the window is, I think it runs normally. It runs from January yeah. next year, and then you'll have through till probably like end of April yeah. twenty twenty four to get the time. So there's kind of a few few opportunities to do mm. it, yeah, and cut down my time in chunks. Hopefully, I think with you it's really exciting because possibly unlike some other runners who might be running kind of at the top level for a while who might have a better like sense of where the ceiling would be for them. For you, the, the, the possibilities are maybe more exciting because actually you're still relatively new to marathon running. Yeah, yeah. And I do feel like, you know, I do feel like there are so many more improvements I can make yeah. in so many aspects of my training mm. because I haven't, I haven't done that for the last 10 years or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's, I've still got that, all those improvements that I can make. And I think, yeah, it's not... I do kind of feel like it's not just marginal games and chipping away at the seconds. Yeah, it's exactly. actually like I could take a good chunk off still. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, have you got like a marathon in mind to do it out? Or is that kind of, does that depend on a few too many factors? I think it's kind of hard to plan this far out, but yeah. I would love to do Berlin. Yeah. Okay. And actually timing wise, that'd be great. Yeah. Mm. I think after this year, it was such a fast race and it's... Yeah. Yeah, it just seems like a really great one to do. Have you ever so. run it before? No. Okay, well, right. yeah. No, yeah. but I've, yeah, I've heard a lot of good things. Have you done so. Berlin? I haven't actually. I'd like to. I haven't either. Yeah. Well, let's go. Oh, let's go. The <laughs> Olympics will be coming. <laughs> Off we I go. I feel like with all the beer and parties afterwards, I'll get a good contingent yeah. of supporters as well. I yeah. could oh, get a fan club along. That'll be the we could just, yeah. We could just turn up like, afterwards, actually. The family will definitely visit. You know, yeah. you go, <laughs> I'm doing a race. And they go, man, man. And you go, it's Berlin. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, sure. Yeah, I'll be coming. Yeah, exactly. sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> good party. Yeah. Has there been any like a great revelation for you in the in your processes, like a bit diet or a training or you know I'm just because there's it's it's such a steep learning curve that you've kind of gone into that you mm -hmm. kind of we don't really get that in the modern world of athletics and like and running you don't kind of get that huge sort of shift in like lifestyle. Yeah. Was there anything like did you suddenly realize like oh yeah like if I just eat that i'm like that made a huge difference or like my diet before was terrible and now i'm like someone's telling me like this is fantastic or it was or did it it was obviously going well for you before anyway but just the shift to just time i guess being the main thing yeah i think time and just and consistency but i mean i wouldn't say there's been one revelation so there's just been so many revelations right. and i think kind of re more recently a big one has just been about recovery and that's what I used to really neglect. And my approach was I mean, do as cram as much training in as you could. Yeah. And as much as your body could tolerate. And just, you know, that will get me there. And actually to get any, it's not just about not getting injured. It's about adapting and actually improving. And I didn't, I, you know, I don't really, I hadn't been taught all this growing up because I mm. didn't do athletics. Yeah. And just learning about kind of, the more sciencey aspect of actually how recovery benefits has been has been amazing, and I think especially when I was working full time, you know, I'd go to work, I'd well get up, train, go to work, go to training in the evening, get back late, kind of couldn't sleep because I was wired from training, mm. and then you'd be up at six and do it all again. Yeah, 
And in my mind, was that, that was like, okay, this is how I get good. Mm. And yeah, it got me good. But I think you need, I think I've realized the importance of recovery. And I've seen, since I, I'm lucky enough to now just do running for my job, that has been the main difference, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. My training hasn't changed that dramatically. But it's just been the recovery and the, the gains I've noticed from that. Well, thanks very much for coming on the Runners World podcast. Great to talk to you about your marathon journey. And we wish you all the best for the Olympics in 2024. Thank Woo-hoo, you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Runners World podcast. Please do subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on a traditional format, just subscribe to the podcast. And uh, thanks for watching. Told you. What a pro.